All right, it is eight, so let's get started. Um, just as a reminder where we were on Monday, we finished our carbohydrates and we have moved on to our lipids now. So we looked at how to name the lipids systematically based on the number of carbons and the number of double bonds. Um, we looked at some of the trends of lipids, that is what happens with the melting point as chain length increases, what help, happens with the melting point when you have double bonds. Then we looked at our tags, which are triacylglycerols, where you have this uh, glycerol backbone with three fatty acids attached to it. And lastly, the last thing we covered on Monday is our glycerophospholipids, which is if you take one of the glycerols and replace the alcohol with a phosphate, you get glycerol 3 phosphate. Then you can further modify the phosphate to make a different lipid. And based on what modification you do, the lipid gets a new name. And all these lipids have different functions and properties that we're not really going into uh, right now. Uh, just too much to cover if we go down that route. But um, just know the type of modifications that do occur for glycerol phospholipids in their name and what they look like. And this slide is actually just a uh, copy. Um, so nothing to say here. But what we are going to talk about is a different class of lipids called the sphingosine. Now, usually in biology classes, you I would imagine most people know about the glycerol phospholipid, and maybe you don't know as much about the sphingosine. But think of the sphingosine as another template as the glycerol phospholipid is. So there are some similarities to uh, glycerol and the sphingosine. First, we have our three carbons that act as a backbone. And two of those carbons have an alcohol group on them at position one and three. But what makes the sphingosine different is what's happening at carbon two and also at carbon three. So sphingosines have nitrogen on their second position, so an NH3. And at their third position, they always have this group, right? You have a double bonded carbon compound, then 12 carbons and your last carbon. So overall, if you just look at the tail, this is a total of 15 carbons at position three for your sphingosine. Uh, the first two are always going to be double bonded together. So again, the sphingosine is just like another type of backbone lipids can have. And sphingosines are a huge component in the cell membrane. Um, they are uh, very important in your neuron cells as well. Um, for example, down here, we have a type of sphingosine called a sphingomyelin. And you might have heard that word before in your biology classes, the myelin sheath, uh, which covers your neurons. Well, they're made out of sphingomyelins. And if we look at our sphingomyelin, we can, again, pick out the parts that are a sphingosine. So you have your oxygens at positions one and three. You have your 15 carbon compound at position three. But if certain modifications make a sphingosine into a single myelin. myelin. One, we have this palmitate. Um, palmitate is a fatty acid. It's one of the most common fatty acids. So 16 carbon fatty acid here at position two. And then at position one, we have phosphocholine which is actually something we talked about on Monday when we talked about choline. So that's a choline group with a phosphate on it. 
So that's called a single mile, mile limb. Now, we also can make a simpler modification where if you have any fatty acid at position two, it's a ceramide. So the naming scheme seems to um, confuse a lot of people. Um, so the way to break it down is that like you're a sphingosine if you have this backbone. If you have a fatty acid, you become a ceramide at position two. So if you have a fatty acid position two, you're a ceramide. And these two, and this is a gangliocide, are further modifications, right? So technically, both sphingomyelin and a gangliocide are ceramides, but with further modifications. And all of these are sphingosines. So that's kind of like the breakdown. Like the sphingosine is the... Um, most general name you can have for these type of molecules, then it, when, they, when they get a fatty acid position two, the general name is a ceramide. And then you break it further down based on the head group at position one. If you have a phosphocholine at group one, you're a sphingomyelin. If you have this giant sugar compound, you are a gangliocide. And gangliocides, um, they can... Um, have different sugars at position one. So here we're just saying, showing glucose, galactose, glucosamine, and galactose again. But the thing about gangliosides is that they always have this silic acid. They can have multiple copies of this as well. So gangliosides, I'm just showing one example of what a gangliocide could look like, where you have your fatty acid at position two again. And then at position one, you just have a bunch of uh, sugars. Can be varied, but the constant here is that you're gonna have this salic acid. So that's a gangliocide. And a question you might see on test three is something like this, where I ask you for classification. So since I just went over this, I'm actually gonna pop up the poll as a way to, you know, See who is here. Um, so hopefully you get this one because I just went over it about 30 seconds ago. But tell me, for a glycosphing, if you have a glycosphingolipid that has a lot of sugars on it, and one of those sugars is a salic acid, what is that class of molecule called? So going to take a minute to do this because like I said, I just said the name about 10 times. So hopefully, hopefully you can get that one. So about 15 more seconds and I'm going to close. So please answer if you have not done so yet. All righty. So I guess it's still early. but the correct answer is gangliosides. So it was actually a 50-50 split between gangliosides and sphingosides. So like I just said a bunch of times, if you have a sphingoside that has a bunch of sugars on it, that's called a ganglioside. So it is C. And gangliosides always have at least one salic acid. 
All right, here's another little, are you awake yet? Did you just take in that information I said? Another good uh, review question. Here, I'm showing a molecule. Where would you put the fatty acid if you want to change this molecule into a ceramide? Position A, B, C, position A or B, A or C, A, B or C, or somewhere else that I'm not showing on this molecule. So uh, take a minute and answer this one to see if, if you understand what I just said about uh, ceramides. Again, do like 20 more seconds here. So uh, please answer if you have not done so yet. All right, so let me go and save that. Okay, so that's saved. Uh, the correct position is A. So if you take a sphingocyte and you add a fatty acid on carbon two, that is called a ceramide. So that's our naming scheme for these types of molecules. So any questions about uh, that to begin with? Any confusions? Anyone want? Uh, more, uh, just another explanation, anything at all. All right. So let's get away from our classical straight chain lipids and talk about some other things that you might not consider lipids, but they are lipids. And we start with our steroids. Um, so what a steroid is, it's any molecule that has been derived from this basic structure down here in the bottom left is A, B, C, and D, which is called cyclopento uh, perhydrophenanthrene. Not a word that I would expect people to memorize and not a word I expect people to be able to pronounce, um, but that is what this molecule is called. We can just call it a steroid. And the most abundant steroid for us, for uh, eukaryotes is cholesterol. And what cholesterol is, if you just take this ring, and you just add some modifications. So you add some methyl groups in this long chain uh, carbon group. And at here, you have a tiny little bit, little bitty uh, alcohol group. Um, so this cholesterol is very important in the plasma membrane, right? So 30 to 40% of the lipids in the plasma membrane are actually cholesterol. And the big thing that cholesterol does is that it modifies the fluidity of the membrane. So modifies fluidity. 
What do I mean by that? Well, the way I think about cholesterol in the plasma membranes, it's almost like planks of wood. So what I'm drawing here, these are lipids and these are cholesterol. And by adding more cholesterol, what you're doing is that you push lipids together. Because you can see cholesterol is this big ring-like structure. And the reason why I think of them as like wood is because they're like a plane, or like a rigid plane that you just shove in the membrane. And the more cholesterol, the more solid-like your membrane becomes, which is a good thing because your membranes have to have this semi-fluid, semi-solid uh, composition, right? They have to have movement like a, a, a liquid, but they have to stay together like a solid. And cholesterol can modify this. Um, so that's how eukaryotes modify, one of the ways eukaryotes can modify their membrane fluidity is by increasing or decreasing the amount of cholesterol in the plasma membrane. Of course, I'm sure many of you have heard that cholesterol is kind of like the boogeyman of health, where it's like, if you have too much cholesterol, that's a big problem. And that is true. Um, and that's something we actually talk about in biochem too, the uh, biochemistry of why cholesterol is bad and how your body handles that. Um, but for right now, we're just going to focus on cholesterol's function inside the cell as a main way to uh, increase or decrease fluidity. Now, plants... They don't have cholesterol. So cholesterol is um, uh, an animal thing for the most part. But they do have other steroids that they use instead uh, than cholesterol. So that's why if you have high cholesterol levels, eating a plant-based diet is really good because as animals, we naturally make it. And if you eat a lot of meat all the time, you're just ingesting more and more and more of it and your body has a really hard time of dealing with all the access. And so if you eat plants, um, you, you lower the amount you intake and your body is actually capable of destroying cholesterol on its own. And so levels can start to dip down after that. But yeah, that's the uh, one type of major um, lipid in your membrane is cholesterol. So any questions about the steroids to begin with? or cholesterol in general. All right. Now, steroids just aren't in the membrane though. One big class of steroids are hormones. So again, if you ever look at a molecule and it has this ring-like structure, that means it's a steroid. Anything with that, that structure is a steroid. So some common ones, uh, cortisol or glucocorticoids, um, they can really affect metabolism, um, inflammation, stress, uh, Aldosterone and mineralocorticoids, um, they help with salt regulation of kidneys, uh, estrogen, uh, sexual development, um, testosterone there, and estrogen. And these are made by the adrenal glands. So when we talk about steroids, you can talk about a lot of different functions. And cholesterol is mainly the membrane lipid. And all these other ones are mainly your, your hormones. And don't worry, I'm not going to like ask you to memorize any of these structures. Like I'm not going to give you a structure and say, what is the name of this? Is this cortisol or testosterone? Um, rather, 
what I'm more focused on is, do you know the role of steroids inside the body? Do you know what cholesterol does? Um, do you know examples of these hormones? So that's our steroids. The next type of lipid we're gonna look at are called the isoprenes. And what an isoprene is, well, it's shown right here, but isoprenes are just made out of these units. So you just connect these units over and over and over again. And these can interact with the membrane, but they aren't a structural component as, as shown here or as in that bullet point right there. And these are soluble, obviously, in the membrane. I say obviously, because if you look at one example of our isoprene, it's nothing but carbons and hydrogens. Remember, the membrane is nonpolar. And so anything that's nonpolar can move around in there. And our isoprenes are one molecule can do that. And Probably the isoprene you have heard of, if you've taken higher level biology classes, is coenzyme Q or ubiquinone. And what coenzyme Q does is it's part of the electron transport chain, and it carries electrons from um, complex one and complex two to complex three. So it'll take those electrons, move along the lipid membrane and deliver them to complex three. And when you look at cytochrome Q, our ubiquinone, you can see our isoprene um, structure right here. So it's forming the tail of our coenzyme Q. But coenzyme Q is not the only isoprene um, in our body. It's a whole class of things. So your book goes over this, um, my videos went over this, but a lot of the vitamins that uh, we take and make are made out of isoprene. So I'm just going to go over one example here. Uh, vitamin A, also known as retinol, is made out of isoprenes. So again, I'm just going to go back to the last slide. You can see our isoprene is carbon, 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 four carbons in a row, and then you have one methyl group poking out, not part of the main chain. And so we have that here, carbon, 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 and so on and so forth. So our vitamin A has these repeating isoprene units and they are made from beta carotene. And so, Here's a question from your understanding. What vegetable should you eat if you want to improve your eyesight? What have you heard? What vegetable should you eat? If you want to improve your eyesight. Carrots, yeah. So that's what you've heard. I hate to break it to you, but that's a big lie. So carrots do have beta carotene. That's true. But you can eat as many carrots as you want. You're not improving your eyesight because the yes, that is a total lie. And it's a funny way that lie came about. Just going off, not just going a little history lesson here. Um, back in World War II, um, England were like the first country to make radar, right? And so Germans would bomb England, but they knew they were coming because of radar. And so the Germans were trying to figure out, or it, it might not have been radar. It could, it could have been they cracked their code. I actually forget now that I think about it. But anyways, the English knew the Germans were coming to bomb. And Germans were like, how do you know this? And so... England said, well, the English people can see better at night because they eat a lot of carrots. That's why we know you're coming. And that's how that myth has propagated until now, where if you ask anybody on the street, like, what should you do if you want better eyesight? Eat carrots. It's all from that. Because even though 
And it, there is some basis to that in that, like I say here, beta carotene, which is in carrots, makes vitamin A, which we use to see. The only problem is if you eat like a lot of carrots, you're not gonna repair any eyesight, right? Um, once damage is done to your eye, that's very hard to reverse. And it's not like eating those carrots will make your eyes like super powerful or anything. It, the thing about carrots is that they can help slow down your eyesight going bad. They can do that a little bit, but they can't really improve your eyesight. So that's your fun little history slash biochemistry lesson for uh, today. And the way that vitamin A works in your eyes is you have uh, retinol and you have retinol or retinal, right? It depends what that X group is. And when your eye sees light, that photon of light interacts with retinol and makes a chemical reaction, right? One of those double bonds uh, becomes like a single bond. And due to that one little movement of that, or one little change in that vitamin A structure, your brain recognizes that as light. And so we see light because of that one little chemical reaction. And that's why they're on the uh, uh, PowerPoint, even though it says deficiency, it should say deficiency. If you don't have vitamin A in your diet, you're not gonna remake this retinol and then you can't lead the blindness. And there's like no reverse in that once that happens. So um, it's important to eat your carrots, important to get your vitamins, but don't expect to eat carrots and get better eyesight. That doesn't happen. But yeah, any questions about our isoprenes or vitamin A or anything up to this point? All right, moving on then. Let's get to bilayers now. So in the previous section, we just simply looked at lipids by themselves. Now we're gonna to transition to looking at lipids in our bilayers. And we're gonna start by differentiating single tail lipids versus two tail lipids. And first we have a different definition of a word amphiphilic. So hopefully you remember from your chemistry slash biology classes, what amphiphilic means. An amphiphilic molecule has both polar and nonpolar parts of it. So lipids, classic example, polar head group, nonpolar tail. That's an amphiphilic molecule. And when you place these in water, if you have enough of them, you're gonna form a micelle. And there's calculations out there um, about you know, how many lipids you have, what kind of size and shape of micelle you'll make or if they'll make a micelle. Um, but basically, you know, you'll form these different micelles. And what a micelle is, is that the outside, all the polar head groups are pointing on the inside, your nonpolar tails are interacting. Uh, depending on the size, you can have water in there or not. If you have like a empty canvas in the inside, we usually call those vesicles. Um, this yellow here, it says the van der Waals envelope. Um, in case you don't remember from uh, chemistry, think of that like sterics basically the same thing. So that yellow triangle is showing you the real size of that molecule, right? And you can see in the vesicle, all these tails kind of line up. So that's what happens when you have just a single tail. However, if you have two tails, like what happens in our glycerol phospholipids and our sphingolipids, you can now form a bilayer. And the bilayer, here we have two sides 
each polar head group on each different side. And then the middle is where all our tails are interacting. So we have two polar sides and one nonpolar side. So that is a bilayer. And the bilayer, like I mentioned with cholesterol, um, is part liquid, part solid. And what I mean by that is that if you think of it as like a lipid, or sorry, as a liquid, not a lipid, as a liquid, your lipids are free to move inside the bilayer. And there's two different ways that lipids can move. They can move via transverse diffusion, where if you follow the orange, the lipid move from one side of the bilayer to the other side, or lateral diffusion, where it just moves left to right in the same plane. Both are possible. The transverse diffusion, as I have right here, is very slow, while lateral is very fast. Who wants to take a shot at explaining to us why transverse or flip-flop diffusion of lipids is extremely slow? It takes like a day for one lipid to do that, while lateral diffusion is extremely fast, happens all the time, happening right now inside your cells. What's the difference between the two that can explain that, that chain, that difference in speed? Why is one slow and one fast? Anyone have ideas on that? So it looks like we have it there. It's because the polar head group for this to happen, transverse, has to go through the nonpolar area of the bilayer. And this polar head group is surrounded by water. So it's happy. It's making all those nice interactions. To go through here, it has to shed all the water, which takes a lot of energy. And it has to trans, uh, travel through an area of the membrane where it can't interact with anything polar, which is very unfavorable for a polar molecule. So uh, flip-flop, like I said, it does happen. It's just incredibly slow. But lateral, you're not changing any polarities. You're not moving the head group into nonpolar territory. So that happens all the time. You're moving left or right uh, very fast. So that's like the liquid part. And the solid part is that this lipid bilayer stays together, right? It's not going to break apart easily. And if, in fact, you can transition. There's actually a temperature called the transition temper, temperature where you become more liquid-like and more solid-like. So here on the right, we have our lipid being more solid. You can see all the chains are uh, together, straight, interacting. On the left, they're more liquid-like. They're more flexible, more movable. In question, how can you transition between the two? So I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, to transition between being in a more liquid state and a more solid state, um, you can do a couple of things. The easiest is temperature. The hotter you are, the higher the temperature, the more liquid you're going to be like your membrane. The colder it gets, the more solid-like your membrane is going to be, the less, less mobile your membrane. So temperature is the easiest one. Cholesterol, as you increase cholesterol, your membrane starts to look more like on the right. You can also modify this via lipid tail length. The longer your lipid tails are, the more solid like your membrane is going to be. And double bonds. 
the more double bonds you have, the more liquid-like your membrane is going to be, the more fluid it will be. And so that's this is actually a common strategy in all organisms, um, especially for bacteria, right? So bacteria go into an area that's very cold. So if it's cold, your lipids are going to uh, start to solidify. You don't want that to happen because you need this you need this happy medium between solid and liquid light. And so what bacteria will start to do under cold temperatures is that they'll start to have more double bonds and shorter tail lengths, which will make their lipids more fluid. While if a E. coli goes to a very hot environment, the opposite will happen. If you're very hot, you're gonna be more lipid-like and you're at danger of your membrane just breaking apart because it's way too fluid. And so to hold it together, what E. coli can do is increase the tail length and uh, have fewer double bonds, start making those type of lipids and your, li and your bilayer will start to hold together better. Um, so it's very important to maintain that balance of solid and fluid-like and at least when I was a student, I always thought of the membrane like this, you know, it's nice and ordered. All the tails are just like barely touching. Uh, this picture on the right is a much better representation. It's just a bunch of chaos. Uh, the blue things are water. The red um, are your head groups. And this, uh, this gray are your carbons. And you're gonna just see everything is just kind of crisscrossing in, in chaos. Here. It's not like everything's nice and striped. Everything's going to be bent and interacting. But yeah, um, any questions about any information on this slide or anything at all up to this point? All right. So that was, so in transverse and they can move faster when it's fluid. Um, so they are more likely to do that faster, the more fluid like your lipid it's gonna be. That, yeah, because the more fluid like it is, the more like energy there is. So the more likely transverse will happen. It's still gonna be very unlikely though. Um, like I said, it takes like one lipid one day to do that. So in every one of your cells after a 24 hour period, you might have one lipid that did transverse diffusion. And you have like millions upon millions of lipids in each one of your cell. Um, so still very rare, but more possible when you're you're more fluid like yes and so we talked about the lipid membrane now let's talk about how membranes and proteins interact combining our uh, two chapters here, or I guess proteins were multiple chapters, but our, our two biomolecules here. And we have different classes of proteins that interact with the lipid bilayer. And the first we're going to look at are integral proteins. And integral proteins can only exist in the membrane. If you take an integral protein of a membrane, they fall apart, they unfold, they can't work. They have to be inside the membrane. And here are some hydro, uh, hydropathy, hydrophobicity plots. Hopefully we can read these now after I'm um, going through that section after uh, testing on that. And here we're looking at two different proteins, glycophorin A and bacterial uh, rhodopsin. And what these peaks are in these numbers, remember high numbers mean hydrophobic, 
and these negative numbers mean hydrophilic. And these different peaks are showing you how many times these proteins travel through the membrane. So for this protein, glycophorin, it only travels through the membrane once. Uh, bacterial rhodopsin travels through the membrane seven different times. And so as this image shows on the bottom here, if you're an integral membrane protein, you travel through the membrane. And the parts that go through the membrane are hydrophobic. So isoleucine threonine here is polar, but it's right at the head group. But leucine, isoleucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, glycine, valine, met, al, gly, val, isla, gly, and then threonine. Again, isoleucine, leucine, leucine, isoleucine. So very nonpolar amino acids because they have to interact with the tails. Right outside, you either have a charge group or a polar group. And usually it's a negatively charged amino acid that's going to be interacting with the polar head group. So you usually have a, a glue or an asp. And I believe the studies say that it's going to be mostly a glue, glutamic acid rather the polar head group. And these proteins are very hard to study structurally because um, if you remember our techniques, one techniques to discover the 3D structure of a protein, it's called X-ray crystallography. In an X-ray crystallography, you have to take these proteins and make a crystal out of it. The problem with integral proteins is that to make a crystal, you have to take it out of the membrane and out of the membrane, they don't fold properly. So you can't do that. The other technique is NMR, and that's generally how you get the structure of these proteins, where you basically make a micelle and have your protein in it, and then find the structure of that. And by doing that, we, we found some common characteristics of integral membrane proteins. So they're either made out of these alpha helixes, and these alpha helixes are what are going through the membrane. So the outside of this helix are gonna be your nonpolar residues to interact with the membrane, or they're gonna be these beta barrel structures. What a beta barrel is, it's a bunch of beta sheets and it's in a barrel, right? So the, the inside's kind of empty. And here we can see a protein with three beta barrels together. And you have some empty spots right there where small molecules can go through. Um, so Beta barrels are really a way to transport molecules across the membrane. Um, the most well-studied beta barrel being your aquaporin. And an aquaporin, aquaporin transports water across the membrane. And that's a beta barrel. But yeah, that's an integral membrane protein, something that has to be always associated with the membrane. However, these aren't the only types of proteins that interact with the membrane. We have two other types, peripheral and lipid anchor, right? And what a peripheral protein is, is a protein that can bind and unbind the bilayer. So it can be there sometimes or it cannot be there. So like I have right there, they can dissociate and reattach. You also have lipid anchor proteins. What a lipid anchor protein is, is a protein that's covalently bonded to a lipid. This lipid is interacting with the membrane. And since your protein is stuck to this lipid, the protein is at the membrane as well. And the cool thing about these lipid anchored proteins is that you can detach them from the membrane by cutting the lipid. So if I just come over and chop the lipid off from my protein, this protein flies away, which is similar to a peripheral membrane protein, except once I cut that lipid off, this protein is no longer coming back. 
is gone for good, while peripheral can bind and unbind at will, depending on what cellular signals are, are really present. So those are our three types of proteins, three main classes of proteins that interact with the membrane. You have your integral that always is attached, peripheral, which is attached sometimes, lipid anchor, which as long as you have your lipid, you're attached, and, but once you're cut from your lipid, you are removed. And these lipid proteins, lipid anchored proteins, only certain lipids are really used to anchor these. So here we have farnesyl and <laughs> gurnal, gurnal residues. I always like saying that name because it's kind of funny to say. And what these are, they kind of look like isoprenes almost, where you have these either three residue or four residue lipids that are attached to your protein. Here, we're attaching to a sulfur. So to attach, what amino acid does these furnisol or gurnal gurnal lipids attach to? What amino acid is shown right here? What amino acid ends in a sulfur side chain? Who remembers their amino acid side chains? Cysteine, correct. Remember, cysteine forms disulfide bonds because it ends in a sulfur. Well, here, our protein ends in, a, our amino acid ends in a sulfur. And the only one that does that is cysteine. So cysteine here is covalently bonded to our lipid. If it's uh, three isoprenes, that's the farnesyl. If it's four, gurnal, gurnal. And this is, sticks right into the membrane. And then you have your lipid anchored protein. You can also use a palmitic or a myristic acid. Usually palmitic is used. Uh, this lipid is much rarer to be lipid plank. Or you can add this giant lipid. This is called a GPI linked protein, where you have your protein here and you have uh, your phosphatoethylolamine. Again, this is another head group we talked about where phosphate connected to an ethylolamine. And connected to that phosphate is a bunch of sugars. That's what man, 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 uh, gluck means. Manos, 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 glucose with an NH2 group. Hopefully these letters, you can now make sense of that. Alpha 1, 2, alpha 1, 6, alpha 1, 4, alpha 1, 6. These are the linkages between our sugars. Don't worry, I'm not gonna ask you to memorize that. Like, um, but what I do want you to know is what is a GPI linked protein? If I said that to you, I would expect you to know, oh, it's a protein that is connected to a bunch of sugars, which has a phosphatidyl inositol. That's what the PI stands for. And it is a lipid like lipid linked protein. So that's, that's what I wanted to know. If I said GPI protein, you should know that it's connected to a bunch of sugars and it's a lipid linked protein. And of course you should know what a lipid linked protein is. All right, so any questions about the major classes of proteins that associate to the lipid bilayer? All right, 
And that ends the PowerPoint from Monday. Let me get the one up from for today. And we're going to continue our discussion about the lipid bilayer. And this, let, let's go over what this slide is saying piece by piece. Um, in the videos, I went over this stuff and then kind of just threw it on the PowerPoint to talk about, uh, to remind myself what to talk about. So the first thing here, we're showing an experiment in the top left. The experiment is called FRAP. So this is fluorescence recovery after photobleaching ING. So fluorescence, this is also called Forrester recovery after photobleaching after, I think it's after the guy who discovered this technique, but I always call it fluorescence recovery after photobleaching. All right. So let's talk about the technique of FRAP, all right? So what FRAP is, is that you take a molecule and you add a fluorescent tag to it. So you make it fluorescence. And this can be a protein, this can be a lipid, whatever. And here, our protein is green. And this thing in the middle right here is the nucleus, I believe. But it's green, so this protein is evenly spread out inside the cell. And then what you do is you shoot a laser at part of the cell. And what a laser will do at the right frequency is that it will stop fluorescence. It will kill fluorescence or as we say, it will bleach it. So anything in this circle will never fluoresce again. You have destroyed any fluorescence capability. But what will happen is that molecules, if it's free to diffuse, you'll see some of them diffuse back into the circle. So you'll see little green spots appear. And other parts, you'll see green disappear because it's literally a protein that's just naturally diffusing. And that's what's being shown right here where you have fluorescence. So you're looking at, imagine you're just looking at this one spot before you hit the laser. So it's full of green, full of green, full of green, full of green. You hit the laser, that area has no fluorescence. Then after time, things start to diffuse in there, you're seeing this recovery of fluorescence. So what this technique is good for, one, you can measure how fast things diffuse, right? You can measure the speed of diffusion inside the cell. So speed of diffusion. And along those lines, you can actually ask, are they free to diffuse? Like if you did this on a certain protein and you saw no recovery, and so you did the bleach and it was just a straight line, right? Your take home from that is, oh, the protein I'm studying does not move in the cell. It just stays in one place. Otherwise I would see that fluorescence recovery. So that is FRAP. So before I move on to uh, what these other two images are showing, any questions about FRAP? All right. Now the picture on the right is along the same lines of what FRAP is, but it's a much earlier experiment. So back in the early days, scientists wanted to know, okay, 
do things in the plasma membrane actually move, right? So before they thought of FRAP, another experiment they did was really interesting. So they took a mouse cell and a human cell, and they colored the cell surfaces, proteins, different colors. So the mouse is green, the human is red. So all, these little dots are just proteins, fluorescence of proteins. They then took a virus and they fused these two cells together to make a half human, half mouse cell. You can see at the very beginning of that fusion, let me get a different pen. Black doesn't quite work. At the very beginning of that diffusion, half the cell was green, half the cell was red. And so they've rated 40 minutes. And then they ask, okay, is it still half and half? And what you see is that if you just look at the green, the green moved all across the cell. If you just look at the red, it moved all across the cell. Again, this is showing that proteins inside the lipid bilayer are dynamic. They have movement. For the most part, proteins inside the lipid bilayer don't stay in one place. They are constantly moving. So that's a big takeaway from this experiment. Proteins inside the membrane move. And the image on the bottom right, what this is showing is that the two faces, the two sides of the lipid bilayer are not the same when it comes to proteins. So extracellular versus cytoplasm. And the big thing you can take from this picture is that all of your, um, or the vast majority of your glycolated proteins, your proteins with sugars, and that's what these little spheres are, they're sugars are gonna be facing on the outside. While on the inside, you don't really have many sugars. And the reason for this is that these sugars are really signals. They are sending messages to other cells, other proteins, right? So based on what sugars you're showing, you are sending different messages. It's almost like, um, you know, ships, uh, one way that they talked in the old days is through flags and like different flag positions mean like different letters. It's kind of similar here. Different sugars are, are saying different messages to the outside world. So that's, that's how the two sides of your lipids can be different when it comes to proteins. So any questions about the material on this slide? All right. Now, what we're going to look at is some of the proteins that make up um, the structural components of the membrane, the membrane skeleton. And the major one is called spectrum which we're showing um, in both images here. So spectrin is just a bunch of alpha helixes and two chains come together to make a spectrin molecule. And they're arranged um, going in opposite directions. So the alpha chain, for example, is going end to C this way. The beta chain is going end to C in the opposite way. And these little barrels you're seeing in this image, they are representing alpha helixes. So you kind of see like the alpha helixes kind of like um, just, just build on each other. They kind of aggregate together. And the reason why this molecule is called spectrin is because um, when they were first studying this, they used red blood cells or erythrocytes. <clears throat> 
And basically they took away, you know, the lipids and everything from the urethra site. And they found that like when they did that, they had a cell that looked like a ghost. By that, it had like the same shape of a erythrocyte, what they had left over, but there was like no lipids in it. And so the molecule that was left over, they called it spectrin because a specter is a ghost, right? So spectrin, ghost protein. And erythrocytes have this weird concave shape. And the reason they have this shape is because of spectrum. And spectrin's found in all of our cells, just not erythrocytes. Um, and spectrin is what really gives a cell its shape, right? So here on the bottom image, we are looking at the cell membrane of an erythrocyte. And in our cell membrane, we have different pores. So we have anion channels um, and we have glycophorin A. So we just have different proteins that are running through the membrane. Now on these, at these anion channels, you have different proteins that are interacting. One protein that's in these green spheres is called anchorin. And what anchorin does is that it anchors spectrin to these channels. So that's where anchorin got his name from, as an anchor. See, sometimes, sometimes scientists can be descriptive in their names. They don't have to give a random names so like that steroid. They can call it anchor and ghost. So we said spectrin is the skeleton. And we don't want the skeleton to fly away. We want the skeleton to stay in place. And so anchorin more or less binds the skeleton to these anion channel posts to keep it in place. So that's what anchorin is. That's what spectrin is. And there's a lot of other um, proteins that interact with the membrane. Here's our old friend actin in the purple in tropomyosin. Um, hopefully you remember that from the muscle contraction. Uh, like I said, actin is the most abundant protein, so it's found in everything. Now, here's what actually anchorin looks like. Bunch of alpha helixes in this half circle shape. And this web of anchorin and spectrin makes the membrane have some unique properties. And here is um, an, uh, an example of what spectrin would look like on the membrane. And A, B, and C are proteins. And based on how proteins interact with spectrin, they have different movement properties. So here in protein A, we have protein A like binding spectrin. It's interacting very strongly with spectrin. And so if we were to look at protein A by a FRAP, right? If we did a FRAP experiment for protein A, we would say, see protein A does not move. There is no recovery because it is bound to your membrane, your skeleton. So it is stuck there. Well, protein B is confined in this gate. So it's just in the membrane, but it's surrounded by spectrum. So it's free to move, but it's mo only moving in this little gated area. And protein C, protein C is not in a gated area. So it's free to move all along the membrane. And so we actually see these different types of uh, protein behaviors when we do an experiment like FRAP. We'll see some proteins do not move at all in the, in the membrane. We'll see some proteins move in a confined area in the membrane. And then we'll see another protein just have free range of the membrane and it can move wherever it wants. 
and we can understand that um, that experimental result by understanding this this model of spectrum and how proteins can interact with that. So, any questions about our membrane skeleton, uh, spectrum, anything I have covered up to this point? All right. So here's a question. We talked about these proteins, some being anchored, some having free movement. So why would we anchor a protein? Why would we allow a protein to have movement in the membrane? What are, what's a functional reason we would have these different classes of proteins. Anyone have any ideas on the functional reasons for having these different types of proteins in the membrane? signaling possibly possibly but i guess go a little further than than that the why must that protein be in one spot why can't we just have it go wherever it wants Like, why don't we just allow every single protein to freely diffuse in the membrane? Why would we have some just stuck? And it's actually a simple answer. Facilitate the diffusion of other things. Possibly, yeah, it could do that. But again, you're kind of thinking a little too specific. Take a step back. We don't want them to denature. Possibly, but I don't think there's a big difference in denaturation rates between movement and being stuck. The interaction of the hydrophobic side chains with the phospholipids. No, that so the reason why it doesn't move is because it's interacting with anchor or not anchoring spectrum. I think everything, I think everyone's thinking too specifically. Just to be a barrier. Uh, that's gonna be more spectrum than a protein. Let me, let me ask this question in a different way. Let's see how creative I can get. Okay, this is gonna be a really weird example that I just thought off the top of my head. Okay, let's say that you have a farm, right? And the farm is the same on the left and right. So far. And half the farm, let's say you're growing corn. 
the other half of the farm, you're growing nothing because you live in California and you have no water, All right? So in setup one, you have scarecrows, which I'm gonna put SC, scarecrow. And you just have these in field one, you have them spread right around your cornfield and they can't move. While in field two, you put your scarecrows in little cars and they automatically drive themselves around to different parts of the field, All right? They sometimes are in the corn area and sometimes they're in the nothing area. So using that analogy, why don't all proteins in the membrane just move around, right? Why are some stuck? Hopefully that made some sense where I'm going with that. Regulation protection, maybe. They don't have the proper transport. No, they're, they're just stuck to the anchoring, or not the anchoring, the spectrum, All right? To move, so proteins in the membrane are free to move unless you're stuck to a spectrum. I guess, so let, let me kind of think of where I was thinking about that then. Destroy nutrients. Now, again, everyone's thinking much too specific. Yeah, there we go. It's much more efficient to have them where they're located, right? Just like in that scarecrow example. Some proteins, if you just stick them in the membrane and don't allow them to move, there has to be a reason for that. And the reason is they're either surrounded by something that makes them efficient or they have to be in that one place to be efficient, right? So one, one idea is, okay, I stick protein A in spectrum. Now, I'm going to surround protein A with other proteins that it needs to work with. And it would not make sense if this is a protein that has to work with other proteins for it to move around. So functionally, it works better when it's just in one spot. While some other proteins, like protein C on the previous page, um, work better moving around. They might have to interact with a lot of different proteins. And so they have to be free to move around. Um, so that's kind of like the broad idea I was getting at. There has to be a reason why some proteins are stuck and others aren't. And everybody was giving good, like specific reasons why that could be. I was just looking for the broad statement of, oh, if you're stuck somewhere, that means you work better in that one location. You're either more efficient or if you move around, you don't work at all. That's kind of why I went with the scarecrow example off the top of my head. Because on the left field, they're efficient inside the corn. You're scaring away the birds. On the right field, half the time, you're, not, you're scaring away from birds from an empty field anyway. So why would you ever do that? So for the proteins that don't move, you're efficient right there. So don't go anywhere. How am I going to ensure you don't go anywhere? I'm going to stick you to the skeleton so you're no longer free to move. And you have to stay there. Does that make sense? Or uh, any questions about like that thought process or, or like that logic or anything like that? Do integral proteins move? Yeah, they can. Right. Uh, let me get rid of this wrong. Like A, B, and C can all be integral proteins. The way that I want you to think of the lipid, it's it's like an ocean. Everything's free to move in this ocean, unless you're stuck to the skeleton, or unless you're in a cage of the skeleton, which is made out of spectrum but everything is constantly moving inside the membrane. Like these anion channels, they're moving in the membrane, 
unless you are stuck, which I guess these are. So that was a bad example. But like glycophorin A, it's not bound to spectrin or anchor. So glycophorin A in this model would go in all directions. As long as it does, it, it can't go past these spectrum cages that easily. It can. It's possible. It just takes time. But it's free to move around in lipid. It's almost like a fat ocean because it's all made out of fat molecules. But yeah, instead of water, you just have fat, liquid fat. And it's kind of like solid like. So any, any other questions about our membrane composition, spectrum, how proteins interact, anything at all? Now, I already talked about today how if you look at proteins in glycosylation, the two different sides of the membrane are different. That is also true for lipids. If you look at the lipids on the inside versus the outside, the amount, the types of lipids are different. So here on the bottom left, let's explain this graph. So the inside would be cytoplasm facing and the outside would be uh, extracellular facing. And so total phospholipids, you can see that, okay, 50% of lipids are in the inside, 50% of lipids are in the outside, which makes sense. It's a bilayer. You couldn't have a bilayer if one side had 60% of the lipids. But when you look at specific lipids, some are found to be on the outside. Some are found to be more on the inside. So for sphingomyelins, 20% of all lipids are sphingomyelins on the outside. And 5% of all lipids are sphingomyelins on the inside. And that's kind of what this graph is showing. So like 21% of all lipids in the my, uh, of the bilayer are phosphocholines on the outside, namely like 8% are phosphocholines on the inside. What's very interesting is this last one, phosphatidylserine. Phosphatidylserine is never found on the outside. Phosphatidylserine is only found on the inside. And phosphatidylserine is a signal. And if phosphatidylserine is ever shown on the outside of a cell, that is basically a signal to other cells to destroy me, right? So let's imagine that you as a cell took like a small percentage of your phosphatidylserine and you moved it from the inside to the outside. So now phosphatidylserine is showing on the outside of the cell. You have just told all the other cells around you that you wish to be killed and to go and destroy you. That's what phosphatidylserine says on the outside. So maybe a cell has been infected. Maybe a cell is having some kind of major problem. And it's just a way of saying, hey, Something's going wrong. Please destroy me. So that's that's it's it's a death signal basically. Now we talked about already how going from one side of the bilayer to another is very slow, right? So we we were looking at this image where we have our bilayer, and we already said. If I want to go from one side to another, very slow. However, that must happen 
Excuse me one second. I'm Ah, false alarm, did not actually have the sneeze. All right, so we said that going from one side of the lipid bilayer to the other is very, very slow. But it must happen. Otherwise, how do you have this uneven, uneven distribution? Well, we have proteins for that. We have flip base, and you also have flop base. And I think the other one's called like reverse ace. Oh no, sorry, it's scramble ace. And what these three proteins do is that they move phospholipids from one side of the membrane to the other. Uh, they have different names because they work in different directions. But yeah, they're just a type of protein that takes phospholipid from one side and just shifts it to the other side. So that's facilitated diffusion. That actually doesn't take any energy. You also have translocases, which will move phospholipids using ATP. So for example, phosphatidylcholine. If you want to move it from the inner leaflet to the outer, um, you're moving it from uh, low concentration to high concentration unfavorable when it comes to entropy, right? You're making something more ordered by doing this. So you're taking an entropy penalty. Remember our friend entropy? So you move from low to high, that's not good. So to pay for that entropy penalty, you burn ATP. So you break ATP, that is uh, supplying some of the energy you need to make something more ordered. And the type of proteins that do this are called phospholipid translocases. So um, any questions about our uh, membrane sides and having lipids or how you move them or anything at all? All right. So question two, I have a little review question for something I talked about 20 minutes ago now. Good way to refresh your mind, review, ran the fly, um, see if we understand this concept. And I have a poll for it. And I basically made this poll true and false. So what I want you want to know is that for each experiment that I'm showing there, do you think FRAP, as we described, would be useful for doing that type of experiment? So answer true and false for that. I'm going to give you a couple minutes to go through that. And then I'll be back to discuss to make sure there's no misunderstandings about FRAP. <laughs> 
We'll do about 20, 25 more seconds. So uh, please get your answers in. Even if it's just, just a guess at this point. Let me get those. All right. So very quick, brief review. Frap, the color things. Uh, you add fluorescence to a protein, hit it with a laser, and you bleach that area. Then you ask, you know, do we see fluorescence go back into that area from diffusion? So first, is FRAP useful for the concentration of a protein in a cell? It is not, right? Fluorescence itself could be, you could measure fluorescence and kind of say how much proteins in that cell. Um, people do that. Um, it's not very reliable though, but it's a good rule of kind of a good, just like base estimate. However, that's not FRAP, that's just fluorescence, right? So no, you can't really do that with FRAP. B, the diffusion of proteins in a cell. Yeah, that's basically what the technique is, right? You, you add fluorescence, you make one area no longer have fluorescence. You see how long it takes for that area to recover in fluorescence. And so you're seeing how fast things diffuse, that's true. The speed of flippings, false. So as a reminder, flipase, what flipase does is that it moves one lipid from one side of the membrane to the other one. And if you're doing this experiment, you are basically, you know, you're looking at the cell, like, so here's my little microscope. That's my field of vision, microscope. And the membrane to you just looks flat. You can't tell the two different faces of a membrane. You can't tell like the extracellular versus the intracellular face, like through a microscope. So you can't tell if a lipid is going from one side to the other one. It just looks like fluorescence stays in the same spot. How about the diffusion of a lipid? Sure. Um, as long as your lipid has fluorescence, you can do that. So FRAP is uh, really used to, for, um, couple main purposes. One, are things free to diffuse? Two, how fast it diffuse? But it's only lateral, only moving left to right. All right, so uh, any, any questions uh, so far about FRAP or about anything else? And hopefully if you ever go to Starbucks and you order a FRAP, you'll, you'll just think of this instead of a Frappuccino now. Give me a fluorescent recovery after photo bleaching, please. All right. Now, a lot of the times, at least when I was a student, when I thought about the membrane, one, I didn't think there was proteins in it. I just thought it was like lipids and just like a uniform area of lipids covering the cell. And hopefully by today's discussion, you can see that each side of the cell or each side of the membrane rather is different, has different lipids. The extracellular side has a lot of glycosylated proteins. You have this membrane made out of spectrin and based on how different proteins interact with spectrum, they're either stuck in one place, confined to one area, or free to move. Well, there's actually even more, more areas uh, of the lipid membrane. And one of these are called lipid rafts. And what lipid rafts are is that they're an area of cholesterol and lipids floating together on this fat lipid ocean. 
So here's an example of a lipid raft, right? Green being cholesterol, blue being proteins, and then you have some glycophospholipids and orange. And so these travel together as like a domain. And it's similar to the domains we talked about in proteins, where it's just an area of localized structure and function, right? And these lipid rafts, as, as listed here, um, they're going to be more ordered. So they're going to be more solid-like. You're not going to have that much fluidity in them um, because you have things very, being very packed together with proteins and crystals. So that's why it's called a raft. It's like a solid moving object on your lipid ocean. And the proteins that associate with these rafts are often these GPI link proteins. Um, remember, these GPI link proteins are the ones, uh, they're lipid linked, but the lipids have a bunch of sugars on them. And these lipid rafts, although people haven't looked at this, it's, it's thought that every type of cell would have um, the problem with lipid rafts is this is how our cells are usually invaded. Uh, the flu, measles, Ebola, HIV, and I believe also COVID, the way that they attach to our cells is that they attach to these lipid rafts and then they invade our cells. Um, unfortunately, we need these lipid rafts so we can't do anything really about it. We can't like break apart our lipid rafts because if we do that, we'll die because we need them to live. Um, but yeah, they, they are a point of infection uh, for us. All right, so here I'm kind of gonna take a step back. So, we're going to talk about the secretory pathway. And what this pathway is, is we've been talking about uh, membrane proteins. So this, this is how, this is really asking how do proteins get to the membrane? So if I'm making a membrane protein, how do I actually make that membrane protein? Like, and for example, here, we're looking at integral membrane proteins because from your biology classes, hopefully you've learned that ribosomes make proteins. These ribosomes are in the cytoplasm or they're connected to the ER. So the question is, if I'm making something in the cytoplasm, how do I insert it into the membrane? The first step of that is this, what I'm talking about here, which is the secretory pathway, all right? So that's what this image is gonna be showing us. And let's walk through the secretory pathway step-by-step step, or how do proteins get in the membrane? So first off, we start at point one. Green is our mRNA. This purple thing is our ribosome making the protein. And so we're making our protein, making our protein. And at the end terminus, if you are destined to go to the membrane, you're going to have a specific sequence. This is what we call the signal peptide. Down at the bottom is a bunch of signal peptides of different proteins. And when we look at all these signal peptides lined up, we can see some characteristics. One characteristic is that the vast majority of them have a positively charged amino acid very early on. And shortly following that char positively charged amino acid, you have a bunch of hydrophobic amino acids. And if you notice, there's a lot of leucines in here. So you have a hydrophobic, more or less patch, bunch of leucines. And when this tail first comes out of the ribosome, because um, this image is actually pretty good. Uh, 
of showing how a protein is actually made, where the mRNA goes in one direction, right? And then out of a little channel, your protein is just kind of like birthed out. And when that signal peptide emerges into the cytoplasm, it will be recognized by the SRP, right? And what the SRP does is that it will go and attach the ribosome and it will attach to the signal that's being birthed. And it'll have GTP attached to it at that point. And what the SRP does is say, whoa, hold on there ribosome. This protein is destined for big things. This protein is destined to be in the, in the membrane. So don't go birthing that, that protein in the cytoplasm. We need to go somewhere special. And so once the SRP is bound to the ribosome, bound to the peptide, stop the creation of this uh, peptide, it will go and drag the ribosome mRNA to this area to two proteins called the SRP receptor and the translocon. And these are in the ER. So the top part of this image is the rough ER. The bottom part is the cytoplasm. So it's going to go and drag it to these two proteins. The SRP interacts with the SRP receptor. So they kind of fit together like uh, puzzle pieces. And the signal peptide goes into the translocon. The translocon is a transmembrane protein of the endoplasmic reticulum. So it has a hole in there. And that hole allows the peptide to go through. Once this complex has been formed, the GTP of the SRP and receptor both go to GDP. So they have a reaction. And once that energy has been spent, they kind of fly away from each other. Like SRP did its job. It brought the ribosome to the translocon. So it's going to go and find another signal peptide to bind. Once the SRP is gone, you are now free to continue to make your protein. And you'll keep making it, making it, making it. And the signal peptide that was used to attract the SRP, uh, sometimes that's cut off, which is what this, let me erase what I have here, which is what this line is showing. This is showing where we cut our signal peptide. Now, this signal peptide is not always cut. Sometimes it's just put right back into the membrane. Sometimes the signal peptide gets inserted into the membrane. Sometimes the signal peptide just stays there. But most often it's just cut off the protein. It just gets cut. So after that happens, you continue to make your protein. You're making, you're making, you're making. You add any carbohydrates inside the ER, as this is going to be a membrane protein. You remember you want to have your carbohydrates on the outside. And then when you're finished, you're going to have any parts that go through the membrane be embedded into the membrane of the ER. And once you're done with the mRNA, the ribosome can uh, break off of the translocon and it'll just go and look for another mRNA to find. And right now we have a folded protein that's in the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum. And our next step is to transport this from the ER to the cytoplasm, to, sorry, uh, the plasma membrane. That's for eukaryotes, though. In prokaryotes, this would be the extracellular space already. Right? Prokaryotes don't have an ER. So they just have a translocon right on their plasma membrane. 
And that's where this process happens. They don't need to do what we're about to talk about next. We're not prokaryotes, we're eukaryotes. So we have to do some extra steps to get a membrane protein from the ER to the plasma membrane. But before I talk about that, any questions about our process of the secretory pathway? Anything people want me to go over again or any confusion or anything at all about what this diagram is, is saying? Are you looking at this diagram and it's just a big question mark? And if it is a big question mark, can you think of specific questions to ask that might help me clear up that question mark? All right, well, no questions yet, that's, that's okay. But if you do have questions, again, feel free to email me, come see me. Um, this is usually something that most students get, but my experience, this is something that they only get after you know some time with it. So spend some time, go over the steps, um, see if it makes sense to you. And if it doesn't, let me know. So let's see here. Okay, so here are some questions about that process before we actually talk about transporting. And this is what we're gonna end our day on, just doing some questions to make sure we, we understand some of the specifics. So I said that the signal peptide is how the SRP binds the peptide and brings it to the SRP receptor. And usually that signal peptide is cut. However, let's imagine there's a mutation. And instead of cutting the signal peptide where it was supposed to be cut, instead it cuts after two loosens. And so if we go back to our, our signals, you can see there's a lot of loosings. So what I'm saying is that instead of cutting right here, it's gonna cut like where I'm making these new lines, for example. And I guess here wouldn't have one, cut, 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 cut. So we're making a cut at a different position. What I wanna know, and by the way, the, the molecule, the protein that cuts it is called signal peptidase. I wanna know if we have that mutation in signal peptidase, what the effect on the process of translocation would be. What is the effect on the process we just talked about? Anyone have any ideas of how a mutation like this would affect our translocation process? What did have any effect? What could happen to that protein if we cut in the wrong place? What are some possibilities if we cut that signal peptide at an incorrect location? What could be the effect on the protein we are making? Would it be non-functional? Maybe. That's a possibility. Possibility number one, misfolded, non-functioning protein. That's definitely possible. What's another possibility? 
And I just thought of another weird example that might, might help where I'm going with this. So you have a car. I'm going to draw a car like a giant rectangle. So I have a car. That's my car. Oh, we have an answer. The SRP doesn't bind the ribosome and bring it to the SRP receptor. Actually, that would not happen um, because the cutting actually happens after it's already been brought. So good idea, but if I cut at two leucines, I'm already at the um, SRP. I'm already in the translocon. So that, that step's already done. The cutting of the peptide only happens after I've been brought. But, but good idea. You're thinking along the pathways and I like that. Yeah, don't be sorry. I, like I said, you're thinking correctly. Just got the steps a little bit out of order. So let's imagine I have a car. Those aren't wheels. Those are side mirrors. So those are the things that I use to look behind me in my car. And imagine something happened where these mirrors got cut off. Would my car still be able to drive? Would it still function as a car if I lost my side mirrors? The answer is obviously yes, right? So possibility two, nothing. It's completely possible. And this is actually um, a, a very big idea in the field of biology slash biochemistry. It's very possible just because you make a cut somewhere else that, oh, okay, the protein doesn't care, right? It, it still functions normally. And the reason why I say this is a big idea um, is because that ties back to mutations, right? And you've probably already learned about this, silent mutations. Just because something changes doesn't mean it will have an effect on anything. Um, and we also looked at this when it came to protein evolution, right? We were talking about locations on the protein that are highly variable, where it doesn't matter what amino acid is there, it will have the same function. And so I kind of want you to be in that mindset when we talk about changes to proteins or changes to anything in biology slash biochemistry. Yes, it could have an effect. That's, that's possibility one. It could misfold. You could have a non-functioning protein. But never forget the other side of that coin. It could have no effect whatsoever. Just because you mutate something, just because you change something, like you make a cut somewhere else than where you're supposed to, ultimately, that could not matter. Ultimately, that protein could still work 100% the same, be totally functional. It's on a protein to protein basis. So any questions about that idea or now that you thought about SRP, uh, anything at all? Right, if there's not, um, that ends our time. So what we're gonna pick up on Monday is we're gonna look at the transportation of our proteins from the ER and how they get to the membrane through the Golgi. Um, so we're gonna look at that. And then we're gonna look at a little bit of thermodynamics and continue from there. Um, so if you noticed last week when we had the test again, I forgot to put the homework up. I have a I'm two for two on test days for getting to do the homework, uh, but I will put one up for today. Um, any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. Um, that's what I'm here for. Um, otherwise, oh, one sec, let me put on my headphones. Yes. Hi, Professor. I just wanted to um, clarify when the exam three material starts. I, I remember we left off on 7.2, but I 
feel like that's not correct. Could you just clarify for me? Uh, sure. I actually have to go and. Um... So, how about this? I, since it is after time, what if I, I, I'll just post that on the announcement on Blackboard because I actually have to open up the PowerPoint and see where we left off. And then, because it was on like some section. Yeah. So, okay. I'll, I'll yeah, do that. Yeah, the announcement will be fine. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I'll put it on Blackboard like right where we left off. So, because it, yeah, you're right. It, it was on that last PowerPoint for uh, chapter two. Um, but yeah, so I'll do that. Um, any any other questions before I sign off here? All right. Um, so thanks for uh, hanging in there with me. Um, only a few more weeks ago, um, but hope you have a good weekend and hope to see you all Monday. Take care, everybody.